Romans chapter 14. We were in the first half last week. We are going to go through the second half, God willing, uh, this morning. As we have begun a number of the sermons in the past really three or four months, we're going to begin again today just with the reminder that the first 11 chapters of Romans are about who God is and what he did for you. His very big salvation of you. The last five chapters of Romans are about what you do to bless God. In other words, now that you know from the first 11 chapters how very big God's salvation is of you, the last five chapters describe your thank you note to God. Thank you for your great salvation, Lord. Because of this great salvation of my life, I now am going to live this life for you. That's the description of the last five chapters of the book of Romans. It's the, it's the life of thanksgiving back to the Lord for his great salvation of you. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 begins this. It says, In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. So that is what you do to bless the heart of God. That is what you do as a thank you note to God. You offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. But what, is, what does that mean? And so that's where we've been now for a number of months. What does it mean to offer your body as a living sacrifice? The answer for the rest of Romans chapter 12, first and foremost, you love. You love that person who is in front of you who ever they may be. Romans chapter 13 also answers the question of what it means to offer your body as a living sacrifice to God. What's the answer in Romans 13? You love. <laughs> chapter 13 verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love them. Meaning, very strangely, that we owe a debt to everyone who we come into contact with, whether we know them or not, to love them. And oddly, we never get out of debt to love them. Meaning, if you love them, you owe them more love. If you love them again, you still owe them more love. If you love them again, you owe them more love. You never get out of debt with anyone to love them. You never get out of debt to your wife, fathers to your kids, mothers to your kids, to your mother and your father. You never get out of the debt that you owe to love them. So what does it mean to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable? It's that very thing. Romans chapter 14 answers the same question. What does it mean to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? Same answer. You love them. You love them. So 1 Corinthians 13, verses 2 and 3 says this, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. So, the whole goal of the Word of God, the whole goal of our salvation, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, is to love. So great is our salvation 
We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice back to God, and that's reflected supremely by loving. Now, chapters 12 and 13 of Romans, they deal really, really the command is loving all people, loving everyone in and outside of the church. You love them. If you want to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, you love everybody that you come into contact with. Romans chapter 14 is a little different. It's exclusively talking about loving those in the church. Loving those in the church. If you are offering your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. If there is a church that is doing that. If there's a church which, whose members, rather, um, each and every one of them are offering their bodies as a, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, there will be a great love for each other in the church. I was reading this morning, Ephesians 1, uh, verses 15 and 16. It says this, Paul writing to the Ephesians. He says, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. And, and, and what stood out for me in that, in that verse there is, is the statement, Since I heard about your love for all God's people. How, what does that look like? What does it look like when a church has a love for all God's people? Paul says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. This is a big deal. A, a lot of the churches that, that Paul was writing to, it was the very opposite. They were not loving each other. If you look at his letter to the, the people in Corinth, the church in Corinth, that, that, that he was correcting them basically for the whole letter, 1 Corinthians, for not loving. But in the church in Ephesus, he says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you because of your love for all God's people. So what does that look like? Practically speaking, what does it look like when a church and its individual members are loving everyone else. Each is loving all. Everybody's loving everyone. What is the, how can that ever happen? What does that look like? Practically speaking, what do I do? What do I do? What do I keep in mind in order to do that? That's what Romans chapter 14 is all about. Romans chapter 14 discusses what a church looks like when the members are truly loving each other. And it discusses two things. The, the chapter is divided in half. It could be divided in half with two sections, each with its own title. Uh, section number one, which would be verses 1 through 13, which we were in last week, the title of that section could be do not judge. Do not judge. Four times, arguably six times in verses 1 through 13, Romans chapter 14 says, don't judge each other. Don't judge each other. Don't do it. About what? Don't judge each other about what? About doubtful Things. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. It says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. Well, what, is, what are doubtful things? Well, we went through that last week. Uh, do not judge each other about things that are not clearly defined as sin in the Bible. Things that uh, people have a freedom to do, but which Christians come in from all different walks of life and they disagree about. His hair is too long. What's up with his hair? It's too long. What's up with his hair? What's up with her dress? It's, it's so immodest. That dude's car, man, isn't that a little bit too expensive? What about all those missionaries and their need for money? What, look at her jewelry. 
Man, it's so loud. What's she doing in here in this church service with loud jewelry like that? Man, that dude has too many tattoos. What's up with that? Or that woman, that mom. You know, she doesn't discipline her kids enough. Have you seen that? But have you seen that, that guy? He disciplines his, his kids too much. That dude owns a gun. What is up with that? A gun? And someone told me that he smoked a, a cigar at his brother's wedding. How can a Christian do... Christians aren't supposed to be doing stuff like that. Did you know that she drinks wine with her dinner, with her husband? Can you imagine that? These kind of things. What did we say last week? Was the proper response to the person judging in that way? It's verse 10 of this same chapter. Verse 10 of chapter 14 says, But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Listen in these doubtful areas. We have to let it be between each individual Christian and the Lord. That's between him and the Lord. That's a common expression, which is a good one in churches. That, that's between him and her and the Lord. Each will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account, verse 12, of himself or herself to God. But we, if we're going to be a church in which everyone is loving each other, we need to love in such a way, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, as to not to judge each other. Jesus, Matthew 7, verse 1, do not judge lest you be judged. Notice um, the words used to describe this kind of judging. Verse 10 says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Contempt. Judging and showing contempt are, are like synonyms there. Or, or look at verse 3. It says, let him not, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and not, let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. When you're judging someone about doubtful things, the Bible says you're despising them. That's what it says in verse 3, chapter 14 of Romans. You're despising them. So this is a, a serious matter. Uh, the church who's Members are offering their body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. They're not judging one another about doubtful things. Now, again, as we discussed last week, uh, th th this chapter is not saying you do not go to someone who's clearly in sin and in love talking to them about it. Hey, brother, I, 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 I've been noticing you've been yelling at your kids, man. Can we talk about that? Listen, Christian, we can and must talk to our Christian brother or sister who we have a relationship about such things. The Bible is really clear about that. But that's not what this chapter is about. This chapter is about judging one another over things that are clearly not, not clearly defined as sin in the Bible. So section number one of Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 13, do not judge. It could be the title. Could be the title. Now, section number two of Romans chapter 14, which is verse 13, to the end of the chapter, verse 23, could have another title, do not harm. So first 13 verses, do not judge. The last 10 verses, do not harm. 
Do not judge first half. Do not harm second half. Look at verse 10 of the previous chapter of Ro that is Romans 13. It's, it says what? Love does no harm to a neighbor. You could just, uh, of the next chapter, verses 13 through 23 of chapter 14, you could all bracket the whole thing and, and, and it's, it's all summed up in, in, in verse 10 of chapter 13. Love does no harm. So, what does it look like? That church in Ephesus, where everyone was loving everyone else. They weren't judging each other, number one, but also they weren't harming each other. Let's talk about what that means. Okay. You may be saying, that sounds pretty easy. Love does no harm. Well, don't speak too soon because it is my personal experience, been in ministry for many, many years, that so many Christians fall short of these verses, verses 13 through 23. Let's, let's go through them. Let's start with verse 13, which is where we began this morning. It says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather, and here it begins, resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Verse 14 says this, I know and am convinced that the Lord, uh, by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Verse 15, Yet, if your brother is grieved, meaning upset, because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Verse 21, It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Okay, so what is going on here? Verse 15 says, If your brother is upset because of your food, because of what you eat, you're not acting in love. That's what uh, verse uh, 15 says here. Now, this may be talking about a Christian who thinks that all Christians should be vegetarians and is upset if someone is eating meat in front of them. That does happen in the body of Christ. Uh, even today, that does happen. But much more likely, it is talking about something that was much more controversial at that time as it is, and we'll see in a moment, it, it can be today. It's, it's Christians who had eaten meat of an animal that had been offered to an idol. So meat had been offered to an idol, it had been sent to the meat market, it had been purchased, with, you know, there's a little sign in front of it, this meat had been offered to, a, uh, to an idol, and they go home and they have a barbecue and eat it. That was very, very offensive to some Christians. Some Christians just said, I, 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 this, this has just got to be wrong. If, if that seems strange to you, well, think about it like this. Many of our church are familiar with voodoo or santeria, some of the practices where chickens and other animals are sacrificed to demons. That's probably exactly the issue that is going on here Animals sacrificed to idols, which the, the Apostle Paul says, behind every idol there is a demon. And he discusses the issue at great length in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, the practice of eating meat that has been sacrificed to a demon or an idol. It was a huge deal at this time. Some just could not believe that could ever be something that any Christian on planet Earth could do. Because meat, come on, it came from an animal that had been sacrificed by a pagan uh, a priest to, a, to, to devils, to idols. So I, I, I have this question 
for you. Would you eat a chicken? Would you eat roast chicken knowing that that very chicken had been used in a voodoo ceremony? Would you do that? See, it comes a little bit more uh, closer to home when we ask that question. Now, let me give you Paul, Apostle Paul's uh, personal answer to that question of whether he would eat meat offered in a voodoo ceremony. It's right here in verse 14 of the chapter we're in this morning, verse 14 of, of chapter 14. He says, I know that and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. He's talking there about food and most likely food offered to idols. Uh, let, in 1 Corinthians, he gets more specific. Let me read this. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. Paul says this. He says, about e he says about the subject of eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. Food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we don't eat it, and we're no better if we do. So what he's saying, meat offered to idols, we are no worse if we don't eat it, and we're no better if we do eat it. There's, You can eat meat offered to idols, is what he is saying. So Paul says there's nothing wrong with eating meat sacrificed to an idol or in a voodoo ritual or whatever. However, however, love does no harm to a neighbor. So at the end of verse 14 of Romans chapter 14, what does it say? But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean, if your brother, verse 15, is upset because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. And so don't, don't get there in front of a brother that you know. They're, they're just, they think it's nuts that you would ever have meat sacrificed to an idol. Don't be chomping on a piece of chicken that was offered in a voodoo ceremony. That's what's going on. That's what Paul is saying. Don't do it. That's harming your brother. He, he's just not going to understand it, is what he is saying. Now, in verse 21, uh, Paul adds wine to the whole mix. He says, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything to which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So here we have it. You're ready to do some business with the Lord here. You're ready to feel a little uncomfortable. I hope so. I will start by saying this. Nothing in the Bible forbids a Christian from drinking alcohol. It's, it's, it's literally uh, a, a, an argument. You hear Christians from time to time Time try to argue that Christians should never drink. First Timothy chapter three says the requirement for to be a deacon in the church is that they not drink, they not be given to much wine. It doesn't say that they not be given to any wine. It says much wine. Uh, it's it's an unsupportable argument. You cannot argue that the Bible forbids drinking. It does forbid drunkenness. It doesn't forbid alcohol. However, love does no harm. First, first part of the chapter, first half of the chapter, love does not judge. Second part of the chapter, love does, not, does no harm. So two things Paul is bringing up here. Many, many in the body of Christ have had a history with alcohol, a, 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 a problem with addiction to alcohol and drinking any alcohol at all in front of them may have a triggering effect on their addiction and cause them to get drunk. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this over the years. 
Someone who has had a history with alcohol sees another Christian drink in their present. It triggers them and off they go. They get drunk or I have seen much worse. Love does no harm. Verse 21 of Romans chapter 14 says to drink a glass of wine in front of them is unloving. Number two. Just as many in the body of Christ simply cannot imagine that a Christian should eat a piece of meat offered to an idol in a, or in a voodoo ceremony, there are many in the body of Christ who just can't imagine that any Christian should drink, and, and they're just offended by it. So what does verse 21 say? Verse 21 of Romans chapter 14, It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything, by which your brother stumbles, speaking about stumbling into sin, or is offended, or is made weak. It just it, it has the effect of weakening, weakening them. So n notice how verse twenty one says, "It's good to neither eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything, <laughs> nor do anything." So same argument with a cigar. There's many in the body of Christ that just can't imagine that a Christian would do that. Not a good idea to fire up a cigar at, at, at a Christian get-together. You're going to offend a lot of people. You, there may be a liberty to do it. The Bible does not have an ex explicit uh, prohibition against it, but it's saying you may have to withhold it. Love does no harm. Same thing with, I, the, 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 there's a long list of things. Boxing, many uh, cr Christians have, uh, have issues with, with boxing or mixed martial art, MMA. Uh, you, you, you go to a Christian party. You don't, probably don't want to say, hey, there's a good uh, MMA fight tonight. Uh, let's just turn it on. Ooh, wow, that was a good elbow to the face. Ooh, wow, look at the nose. is bleeding. No, you, you, you don't want to do that. You, you, you don't want to do that. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Let's just go back to verse 15 again. It says, uh, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy your uh, with, do not destroy with your food or with your wine or with your cigar or with your MMA or whatever the one for whom Christ died. Christ died on the cross. He bled and died. I read in my devotion yesterday uh, every vein of that body of his, that blessed body shed blood that covered you and your sin, but also the sin of that brother. Are you really going to mess with that man's mind, mess with that sister's mind? Because, oh wow, you know, you, you have a freedom. And there's nothing, nothing in the Bible wrong with drinking. No, you can't prove that to me anywhere. I'm going to, I'll, I'll drink if I want to drink. But, but the Bible says that Offering your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It says if you are, you're not harming your brother or sister. Love does no harm. That, remember, that's the title of the second ha uh, chapter, second half of the chapter of chapter 14. Verse 16 says, Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not about a bunch of rules about eating and drinking. It, it, it says it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, when there's a Christian gathering, whether it's in church or out of church, there should be righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when every, brothers and sisters of Calvary Chapel, when everyone goes into a Christian gathering with the attitude that I'm not going to judge and 
I'm going to do no harm. I'm going to love in such a way that I do no harm. They're going to be voluntarily out of love, giving up their wine, their cigar, their MMA boxes and uh, boxing and or, or whatever. And the list goes on. And as a result, what do you see? You see righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is what you see. Verse 18 continues. It says, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now that word acceptable, we did a big word study of it. Better translation is the word pleasing. He who serves Christ in this way, verse 18 says, is pleasing to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify each other. Let's think about how to bring peace into the Christian gathering. Let's think about uh, one of the things that uh, build, uh, something that builds up the Christian gathering or my gathering with my brothers and sisters and not, thing that, not something that's going to bring division. Verse 22, do not destroy, r- rather verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food, for the sake of wine, for the f- sake of cigars or MMA boxing or whatever else. All things indeed are pure. He's saying all, there's nothing wrong with all those things. But it is evil for the man who eats it with offense. So uh, the, the, the person who is drawn into to taking a glass of wine where there's just a history of problems um, in, the, uh, in, their, in their family history or personal history, if they're, if they're prompted to even have one glass, even though against their conscience, It says, at the end of verse 20, it says it is evil to them. Verse 21 is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything to which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Wow. I have seen Christians perhaps more than any other section of the New Testament I've seen them fall short of this one because if there's one thing we like, it's our freedom. Hey, the Bi- I have the freedom. The Bible says I have the freedom to drink alcohol. I have the freedom to smoke a cigar or whatever. Yeah. But are you willing in light of God's mercy, in light of his great salvation of you, to lay those things down. This stuff gets really, really, really hard. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembles. Trembling, you know, some of the decisions that we have to make. You know, I I think of alcohol at, at weddings. I think what this means, what these verses mean, is that you're getting married It's a Christian wedding. You need to put the guest list before the Lord and ask the Lord, by having alcohol at my wedding, am I going to cause any of these folks to stumble into sin? Whoa, whoa, what what are you talking about now? This is my wedding day. This is the one day of my life that's my, it's, it's about me. Excuse me? No, it's not. (laughs) <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, your life is no longer your own. It was purchased by the Lord Jesus. He owns it. It's God's day. Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 21, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now, talk about a distinct love. Talk about a love that you see in no other religion. What do you mean, Paul, you'll never eat again, eat meat? That's crazy. It says, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. I want to go back and address particularly the fathers to something I began with last week. In in the message last week of the first section, Do Not Judge. 
and that was father and that was fathers i was talking to fathers and mothers then but fathers are you loving inside your home in such a way that is different than what it, than what love looks like anywhere else in the whole world because fathers so many children are leaving the home their christian homes they're concluding after they're 18 years old, they leave the Christian homes and they conclude what? They conclude, wow, you know, this is no different than anywhere else. This, is, this kind of love is no different than anywhere else. Uh, the love that I saw in my home, they would be arriving at an accurate conclusion. And then you wonder why they leave. It's because they didn't see a distinct love. And we've been talking about this in, in, in chapters tw uh, chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Have your children been seeing that? In chapter 13, uh, love, oh no on anything except to love them. H have your children been seeing that, fathers? And in this chapter, this chapter arguably is the most radical of all. It says, it's, verse 21 is one of the most striking verses, the most, one of the verses that more than any other verse that I know of talks about, describes a love that is distinct from any other love on planet earth. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Love does no harm. You see, ain't so easy, is it? But, you know, this is the word of God. And, and, and of course, all of this needs to be interpreted uh, in the light of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. Um, uh, am I suggesting that we should start, all of this can start um, getting to a place where, where legalism takes over. For example, well, can't be any, Pastor Steve is saying there can't be any Christian weddings with alcohol. Oh, no, 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 I didn't say, that. don't lay that burden on me. What was the first half of the chapter about? Do not judge. Do not judge, do not judge, do not judge. Someone decides to have uh, alcohol at their Christian wedding, don't judge them. We, it, it, but you see, the flip side of it is the second half of the chapter where it says, do not harm a brother, that we do at least need to be evaluating whether we do have alcohol at a Christian wedding. You know, this whole chapter, it's so important, must be interpreted in light of, again, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what he is doing at, in, a in a community at a certain time. Uh, for example, and if I just may say, the issue being legalism, doubtful things such as what we dress can sometimes take over a whole church to, where, to the point where they're no longer caring about the gospel and the cross and the life and, and righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. They're thinking about how everyone's dressing. And so in some circumstances, depending upon what the Spirit is saying, even if there is offense, there needs to be a change. For example, Pastor Serge in Haiti, uh, when he went down there 12 years ago, it was unheard of from what he tells me for a pastor not to wear a suit. So one could interpret Verses 14 through 23 of Romans chapter 14. Well, that means he, did, he can't wear a suit. It may offend someone. But you see, the, the Holy Spirit was doing something different in that community where it became clear that this doubtful thing, dress, had taken over and had replaced the grace of God. So he started wearing just regular shirts and offended a lot of people. But what happened was the legalism broke down and people could once again see 
the grace of God. The grace of God recaptured the ch- has recaptured many churches uh, in Haiti because of this example. Calvary Chapel in the early 70s. At the time, you did not play guitars on a Sunday morning in a Sunday morning worship set. You just didn't do it. It would offend. It would offend. And so a strict reading of Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 23 would say, I guess we have to just do organs and hymns. But you see what Chuck Smith saw and many others at the time was, now wait a second, this doubtful thing has taken over and replaced the grace of God. So that everyone's attention is now on the whether or not music is being done with an organ and in a hymn book, rather than the grace of God, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so uh, he came in with his guitars, offended a lot of people, but again, eventually the grace of God broke through. And, and, and there was a, a, a greater understanding. And there was in the end peace. I guess what I'm saying is you can't make laws about any of this stuff. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Again, verse, verse 17 says what? The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the what? In the man-made tradition? No, in the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit, as we're seeking his instruction, his wisdom, he'll guide us into all truth. He'll tell us when, if if we're going to do something that offends, we need to we, we, we need to not do it. We need to, to not have that glass of wine or, or not have that cigar or whatever it is. Uh, or the Holy Spirit will say, you know, you need to start wearing a regular shirt and not a suit, even though it offends. It's a ministry of grace. It's a ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, but the thing that is what we must take away more than anything else is that Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, fathers and also mothers, and all of you, Calvary Chapel, means loving in a way that is distinct and different than wherever, anywhere else in the world we may go. So that when our children, after 18, 21, whenever they leave the home, they won't be looking around at everything else going, this is no different. No. They will be remembering that love, that expression of love, that expression of the life of Christ, which is so singular, so distinct, that it has captivated their heart. It's captured their heart and they'll never want to leave it. Father, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the just the operation of the of the Holy Spirit, Lord and how he does lead us into all truth. And Father, um, we are so grateful for your grace. We're so grateful for your freedom. Lord, we, we think of what we read in the Old Testament, something like 613 laws. They've all been fulfilled in Christ. We're no longer under the law, we're under grace. We follow Jesus by the Holy Spirit. We follow the principle of love. And Lord, uh, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the cross which purchased us this life in which there is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for that, Lord. And and Father, we just want to take that, that into our day and to our week and into the prayer meetings right now. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God bless you. Happy Father's Day, Calvary Chapel.